Howdy, First Baptist. Good morning. Welcome to our service on Sunday, August 1st, 2021. So glad you're here with us online. I'm Pastor Dave, if I haven't met you. Thanks for being with us. Got a great service plan for you. We're going to spend some time in worship. Uh, we're going to get into Acts chapter 10 and 11. We saw Saul's conversion to Paul last week. Well, actually, not yet. That's 13. But Saul was converted. And this week, we're going to look at Peter's conversion after being a Christian. Not unto faith, but how the Lord worked in his heart. So, got a great service plan for you. Uh, real quickly, we do have just one announcement. A couple weeks ago, we had Operation Christmas Child Sunday here on campus. We packed 60 boxes. We're getting ready for the holidays. We do have a packing party, if you can join us. Sunday, sorry, Saturday, August 14th, right here in the courtyard outside. It'll be completely safe. It'll be from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. We're going to pack, try and pack 300 boxes. So if you can, join us. We're getting ready for uh, the, the season where we pack thousands of boxes and send them all over the world with the good news of Jesus Christ for children who never get a gift, which is pretty amazing. They don't, they don't receive gifts. So one of the things we do is we give them gifts, and that helps promote the gospel, get them into churches, Bible studies, discipleship all over the world. So join us for that Saturday, August 14th. Let me pray. We'll jump right in. Again, so glad you're here with us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your church. Thank you for those of us who are meeting online. Open our hearts as we worship. Let us come before you in humility and hear from your word. Let's hear the, let us hear the truth this morning, Lord. Thank you that even after you save us, even after we come to faith in you, then you say, follow me, and you change us, Lord. Help us see how you're servant Peter was constantly being changed until the day he died. Thank you for today. In Jesus' name, amen. So glad you're here, FBC. Let's worship together.
sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burdens gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sing my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great Shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? And I shall bow in humble adoration and then.
washes my guilt away Amazing grace When we've been there Ten thousand years Bright shine and hills 
and mountains call. God's love so sure shall still endure all measureless and strong. Redeeming grace to Adam's race, the saints and Well, church, we're going to dive in the word. Again, so glad that you're here. Um, we've been in the book of Acts now. This is our 11th week. We're going to finish with four more Sundays in Acts, um, finish through August. And then before Thanksgiving, believe it or not, in the fall, we're going to take a look at the book of Philippians. And we're going to start a series called Serious Joy. And one of the reasons we want to do that is Pastor Jerome and I and the deacons and others, we just want to encourage all of us as we walk through the book of Philippians that we are Christians, those of us who have become Christians, and one of the gifts we've been given in Christ is joy. And over the last two years, four years, eight years, ten years maybe, with everything that's happening in the world, with everything that's happening in our country, with everything that's happening with this virus still, there's a lack of joy, and I think we can all agree to that. So we're going to look at Paul's letter to the church in uh, Philippi. He wrote it from a prison, and he talks about one of the gifts that we have in Christ is joy. So we'll see that. So let's finish strong these last four weeks. We're going to be in Acts 10 and 11 today. Then we're going to just take some offshoots over the next three weeks and wrap up the book of Acts. I hope it's been a series which you've learned from. And really, uh, we've seen many conversions in the book of Acts. And uh, last week we saw Pastor Jerome teach out of Acts 9 a, a wonderful passage and he talked about Saul meeting Jesus on the road to Damascus. Uh, Luke, the author of this letter or book or account, really, he focuses 20%. It's actually about 18.4% of his book, Acts, on two conversions. So there's many conversions that we see in the book of Acts. But he focuses one-fifth on two, Saul and Peter. Saul's conversion 
uh, in the narratives of Luke and Acts come in Acts 9. That's the actual what happened, the account. And then Paul retells it in Acts 22 and 26. The other conversion, I'm using that word uh, to hopefully go make you think what? Uh, in this book, mainly that is focused on, is Peter. You say, Pastor, Peter was converted years ago when he met Jesus. Bear with me. Maybe entertain me. Narrated or recorded in Acts chapter 10, then recounted again in Acts 11 and 15, is Peter's conversion or maybe transformation. That might be a better way to say it. But I'm using the word conversion specifically to maybe tune your ears in or perk your mind. If you think that becoming a Christian or being converted to faith in Jesus is simply saying a prayer and telling someone you believe the gospel, come on now. There's so much more to that. We at this church war or try to uh, teach and live against the theology that I got my ticket to heaven and I'm good, I can do whatever I want. That is bad theology. We know this. Now, in my personal experience with the Lord, in the summer, July 1985, gosh, that was a long time ago, I met Jesus. I realized I was a sinner. I realized that he had come and paid a price for me. I realized that he loved me, and I asked him to forgive my sins, and I asked him to give me the strength and the grace to follow him. From there, me being a Christian way back then, struggling in ups and downs, there was at least four or five or six other experiences I can point to in my life where I was transformed, in a sense converted to something new. Not unto salvation, that's paid for on the cross, we know that. But the Spirit of God had convicted me or directed me or encouraged me in a fresh new way. Most recently, this happened about five years ago when I was convicted by grace that I don't worship a book in pages alone, but I worship the living Christ who is the true word of God. Some of you have walked with us through that. Hopefully you've learned. That was the latest episode in my transformation on a massive scale. And our two conversion stories... Paul was converted from being a violent, zealous persecutor of Christ in his church into an apostle who would suffer for Christ until his death. That's Acts 9. And in the next chapter of Acts, we get another conversion of Peter or transformation. Don't want you to stumble. Peter was converted from deep, ethnic and religious prejudice against the Gentiles. And we see that in the pages of the Bible. Now Peter, before Acts 10, even as a great preacher and a great apostle, someone who could heal people, remember the beautiful gate a few weeks ago where Peter said, rise and walk in the name of Jesus? Peter, before Acts 10, would not enter a home of a non-Jewish person. Now think about that. He would not eat with Gentiles. He considered them to be dirty and unclean. Big, bigotry is what we call that. This was the great preacher stance and theology towards non-Jewish people. Think about that. This both makes me shudder and gives me hope for humanity. Amen? Peter was transformed or converted against this bigotry and prejudice against those Gentiles. And he was transformed to using the keys of the kingdom to open the door of faith for the Gentiles. We'll see that today. In other words, both conversions of Peter and Paul are from prejudice, shame, blame, to advocacy and love. Paul had been a blamer, a shamer, and a persecutor of Christ in his church. He later became an advocate 
an ambassador for Christ and his church, like I mentioned, to the day he died. Peter had prejudices against the Gentiles, and his theology was that Gentiles had to become Jews first and Christians second. They had to be kosher and be clean in order to receive Christ. Peter is converted from that way of thinking or transformed from that way of living into becoming an advocate for the inclusion of the Gentiles into the church of Jesus Christ. Now, I can't underestimate both of these are radical transformations or conversions. This is where sometimes in our systematic, linear uh, way of understanding faith, we compartmentalize things, and then the mystery of our faith crashes into reality. We don't understand everything. We're called to repent, believe, follow, and obey, and sometimes it is a mystery. I've maybe lost a few of you calling Peter's reality in Acts 10, 11, a conversion. It's a transformation for sure, but he was converted from one way of thinking, even as a Christian, hear this, into the way of Jesus. An 18th century rabbi was teaching, having a conversation with his students, and he posed a question to them. He said, how do we recognize the moment when night ends and day begins? Good question, right? One student said, when it is light enough to tell a dog from a sheep. Makes sense? The rabbi said, no, that's not, that's not it. Another student says, when it is light enough, we can tell a date uh, from a palm or a date tree from a fig tree. Rabbi said, that's not it either. What is it? They didn't know, and they asked, Rabbi, how do we know the moment when night has ended and morning has come? The rabbi said, we know that night has ended, and we know that morning has come when we have enough light to look at anyone and recognize them as brother or sister. That's kind of profound when we think about it. Then and only then the rabbi says, do we know it's become day and it's still not night? You see Peter even walking with Jesus, knowing him as Savior and Messiah, saved and sanctified, preaching amazing sermons, was still unclear who his brother and sisters were. Think about that. For us who've been Christians a long time, think about that and let the Spirit do an inventory on our lives. Moving from the darkness of night into the day of conversion is called sanctification. Hear me, not unto salvation. I don't want to confuse you. What's been done on the cross is paid for our sin. We're adopted into God's family. And the promise of the Holy Spirit. But then God asks us to walk with him. And we're transformed day in and day out. Over and over again. This is all by grace. Saul of Tarsus was in the deep night of, the, of hatred of Christians. And their allegiance to Jesus. His heart was converted and made new. He came into the light of Christ. Peter, though walking with Jesus, was not in deep darkness. He was in darkness of prejudice and bigotry towards Gentiles. His heart was transformed or converted when it was flooded with light by the grace of Jesus Christ. These accounts or episodes recorded in the book of Acts uh, do not depict an eternal light, Rather, an inner light. It is the dawning of God in our souls. God was revealing himself in a new way to Peter. In a deeper way. In a brighter way, we can say. It is this realization 
that hopefully we all go through at some point in our walk with Jesus that John, the gospel writer, wrote about in John 1. I quoted it last week here, or two weeks ago, sorry, Jerome preached last week, but let me read it for you. John 1, the beginning of John's gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I hope you have many passages of Scripture memorized, or at least pseudo-memorized. You can um, kind of paraphrase them. If you don't have this one, this is a good one to come to grips with. Verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. Who the Word? Verse 3, all things were made through him. Who? The Word. And without him, not anything made that was made. Who? The Word. Verse 4, in him, who the Word, was the life. And the life was the light of men. Amen. Verse 5, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. If you don't know the rest, skip down to 114, read it that week. The word is Jesus. Both Paul and Peter came to see their enemies in a new way because of their conversions, their transformations, a new light. The light talked about in John 1 revealed to Paul and Peter these people were not enemies at all. Rather, they were fellow sojourners or fellow pilgrims in this thing called life. They had different skin tones, different upbringings. They came from different parts of the world. They had different ethnic backgrounds, but they are not enemies. And Paul and Peter began to realize this because the light of Jesus was ever increasing in their hearts. Saul saw the church as an enemy of God and he violently persecuted it. We learned that last week. We can even say that Saul saw Jesus as a blasphemer of God. And here's the kicker. He used the Old Testament to get there. Jesus said he was the Messiah, the chosen one, the one from God. But Paul, sorry, Saul and others knew this. Deuteronomy 21, 22, listen to this. And if a man has committed a crime punishable by death and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on a tree, but you shall bury him the same day. Here, for a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land that the Lord your God is giving for inheritance. So basically it says this, Anyone who is hung on a tree is cursed by God and you must remove him before the sun goes down because you don't want to defile your land that, the God, that God has given you. So in Saul's mind, how could Jesus be Messiah when Jesus was cursed by God? So Saul fought and he killed and he arrested in the name of God to protect God. Then on the road to Damascus, Light and love flooded his heart and he came to the understanding that Christ was not an enemy of God and that Christians are not enemies of God. Rather, they are brothers and sisters. The light of heaven converts Saul and then Paul would write this some years later. Galatians 3. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Amen. For it is written... Cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to who? The Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. That was Paul's new understanding in light of Christ. Here's Peter's. Let's read some scripture in Acts 11. Acts 11, starting in verse 5. This account is already happening in Acts 10. I don't want to read both chapters, so you can do that this week. But Peter is reporting to the church in Jerusalem all that had happened to him. So in Peter's words, Acts 11.5, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. 
But I said, by no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my body. This reeks, this vision of Luke chapter 18, uh, the publican and the Pharisee, or the tax collector and the Pharisee. Jesus tells this parable. So if you didn't catch it, Acts 11, verse 8, as well as in Acts 10, Peter says, I will never eat anything unclean. Also saying, I am not like those unclean people who eat unclean things. That's what he's really saying in this moment of prayer, this vision. I am better than others is what Peter is saying. Oof. Verse 9, but the voice answered a second time from heaven, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened how many times, church? Three times. Pastor Jerome did an excellent job of uh, highlighting some different occurrences in the scriptures relating to numbers. Three times. Three is a beautiful number, but what does three mean to you and me in Christ? Three means something is put to death and it's raised to newness of life. That's what three means in the New Testament. So three times in this vision, God, through his spirit of grace, was telling Peter, put to death your trivial ways. Put to death your prejudice and bigotry. That's what's happening here in this vision. Verse 11, And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at my house in which, we were, in which were sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. Peter is repenting and being transformed. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered a man's house, a Gentile's house. Radical transformation. Peter's retelling it. Verse 13. And he told us how he had seen an angel. I'm sorry, the angel stand in his house and say, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who was called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved. You and all your household. Verse 15. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as us in the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, and he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then, God, and then, if then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? Transformation. Verse 18. When they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Amen. I want to wrap this quickly, but this word we get for trance is ecstasis, which means to be outside of oneself, to move from an old to new perspective. We might say a, a contemplative prayer. If you ever had prayer where you've, you felt like, not in a new age way, but you felt like um, it was more than just thank you for my food, Lord. It was uh, a moment of contemplation, maybe a, a period of time, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, half an hour, where you were deep in prayer. Peter has seen the world one way in regards to Jew versus Gentiles his whole life. But now, moving outside of that human, earthly perspective by grace, he sees things in a new way. Peter's perspective was before this conversion or transformation we jews are clean they are dirty we jews are the chosen people they are cursed we are accepted they are rejected we are holy they are profane we are kosher they are not then peter in this moment of grace this episode of prayer begins to see things in a new light he literally has new sight Old reality, new perspective. Old understanding, new enlightenment, all done by grace. This just doesn't happen, let me say that. Peter's prayer life was serious. It was constant. 
It was formative. It was done with humility and contemplation. And if you want that, you just don't flip on a switch. It is a life of discipline and yearning after God. But Peter receives a new perspective. He is converted from one way of thinking to another. And it is a massive thing that happens in the New Testament. Then he reports, as we read, to the church. And the church says, because apparently this was prevalent because Peter wasn't probably on an island thinking this way about Jews and Gentiles. The church says, God be glorified as the Gentiles, Gentiles have received what? The Holy Spirit, just like we did. That's what happened. This is a new perspective of the new kingdom. There is no more other, there is no more them. There are no more enemies. I'll close with this. Jesus' words in Matthew 5 are coming to fruition. Jesus in Matthew 5, verse 43. You have heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I don't know about you, but um, that's a 2,000-year-old message that's never been more relevant than today. If the smart men and women they wouldn't uh, of the social media and media companies just loop that for a week in America, I think our landscape would change, but I'm not sure. I'll read it again. Verse 44. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Hear this. There's a, there's a, uh, there's a, a correlation here. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who only love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? This isn't an ethnic thing Jesus is talking about. This is a knowledge thing. The gospel hasn't come to the Gentiles yet. They are still in darkness. That's what he's saying. You therefore, verse 48, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Oh, daunting, but we've talked about this before. In the original, you must be perfectly merciful is what is being put forth by Jesus. Not perfect under a letter grade or a grading scale, but it is possible in the new covenant of grace for us to display or put forth perfect mercy. And Jesus says, do this. Peter and Saul were incapable of putting forth perfect mercy until more light flooded their hearts. Receive the light of the gospel of Christ. Let that permeate all of your being and love and advocate for all whom you come in contact with. Radical conversions in the book of Acts. If you walk with the Lord for a week, you've been converted. Hallelujah. If you walk with the Lord for 2,000 weeks, you've been converted and you've been transformed over and over and over again. That's what I hope we see out of the account today. God bless you, FBC. We'll be right here next week. We'll be continuing to go through the book of Acts for three more weeks. If you're safe come join us on sunday if you feel safe i should say it that way you are safe um and if you want to august 14th we'll be in the courtyard packing shoe boxes for operations christmas child let me close close in prayer and we'll finish with one more worship set father thank you for your goodness thank you for your word thank you that you don't give up on any of us thank you that you don't uh need perfection to save someone you need uh repentance and faith and that's granted, so you don't even need it, Lord. You gift that to us. Help us take that gift. Help us receive that. Help us to bring forth our prejudices still, our bigotry, our insecurities, maybe our, our loathing, our hatred toward things of this world and even people. Help us lay that at the foot of your cross. Holy Spirit, cleanse us and continue to flood our hearts with the light of the gospel. 
and change us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, FBC. We'll see you soon.
exalted, the King is exalted on high, and I will praise Him. He is exalted, forever exalted, and I will praise His name. Rejoice in this hope